Number nine, the motorcyclist. That one, only 20% of the class answered correctly. So clearly we need a little more work on this topic. So you have a motorcyclist that's going forward. So if I'm going forward, now I don't have the wheel with me here, but if I'm going forward, the wheel is rotating like this. How do I determine the direction of the angle momentum of a wheel rotating like this? Right hand, you take the fingers of your right hand and wrap them the direction that the tires rotate. And then the thumb points to the left, so the direction of the angle momentum is to the left. I didn't draw a picture for that part. I drew a picture for the second part, the torque caused by gravity about the ground. So we have that force of gravity, the green here, force of gravity, and we're calculating the torque about this point here, the ground. So the radius points from the point of contact to where the force acts, hence the race is pointing up and to your right. Cross product is torque is R cross F. Well, the equation is torque is R cross F. Yeah, I got that written down here. And so the cross product, and this was another one that people had a hard time with, was the cross product. You take the index fingers of your right hand and point in the direction of the first item in the cross product. So your right hand, your index fingers should point up and to the right, so like that. And then you orient your hand so that finger stays pointing, the index finger stays pointing that way, but your middle finger can point the direction of the force, which is down, and thumb is pointing that direction. Well, if I'm the rider, I was like this, because this was a picture from the back, and my thumb is pointing forward, so the direction is forward for the torque. And then we have the last one. The last one, the change in angle momentum. That's where we're going to use the rotational equivalent of Newton's second law. The rotational equivalent of Newton's second law was that the net torque is equal to the change in momentum over the change in time. So that means the direction that the, the angle momentum is going to change, oh look, a new student. The direction the angle momentum is going to change is the same direction as the direction of the net torque. Well, what direction was the net torque? It was forward. So the answer for the change in angle momentum also needs to be forward because they're the same direction. So that was by far the worst question on the test. Um, then the next one in difficulty was the one right after it. What condition can be derived from Archimedes' principle regarding buoyancy? Now, there were two answers that are true answers, but only one is derived from Archimedes' principle. Answer B, that less dense, dense fluids float on more dense fluids, i.e. wood floats on water or, you know, iron floats on um, mercury. I think iron's less dense than mercury. I actually would have to check those to make sure. That is a direct derivative of Archimedes principle that says that the weight of the displaced fluid is equal to the buoyant force. A lot of people, the big distractor was E. E is not correct because mass is most definitely not the same as weight. Mass has units of kilograms. It's a measurement of how much material is present, or it is a measurement that tells us about how much inertia something has, whereas weight is a force, force due to gravity. Um, yeah, I'll look at one more problem, and then we'll get started with the lecture. The next problem in terms of difficulty for people was when a fan is switched on, it undergoes an angular acceleration of 150 rads per second squared. Assume it starts from rest. How many rotations will it have completed when it reaches the angular velocity of 50 rads per second? Now, there are some people who got it completely wrong. I gave half credit to people who answered B because when you do your calculation, the correct kinematic equation you don't have time. You're not looking for time. 
So you use your kinematic equation without time there, and you find the angle it goes through is 8.33 radians. And a lot of people said, oh, it's the right number, and didn't stop to think. It didn't ask what angle does it go through. It asked how many rotations. And so to get how many rotations, you simply take that 8.33 radians and divide it by the number of radians in a rotation, which is 2 pi, and that gives you the 1.32 rotations. Of course so. How was the curving? I graded it out of 87. So whatever you get out of it is 87? Yeah, that's the percentage. And you can look on Moodle. It's, it's there. Any other questions about the test? Nope. All right. Let's look at... Okay, go ahead, Abigail. So on 7... It says match each finger with the direction of points if you have the top part of the equation. Yes. This one I wasn't sure was new because you were saying I couldn't ask you, but it says each finger, so I assume that I had to, you know, because technically if you think about it, these two fingers are pointing in the same direction as your middle finger. So did, did I mark you wrong on that? Yes. Okay, bring it back to me. I, I marked a person or two wrong and then I realized exactly what you're saying. Okay. And I tried to go back and correct them all. Okay. So yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. All right, so to the lecture. Oh, that's the last lecture. This one. Okay, just a couple things before we start on all new material. This is talking about what we learned in class on Monday. We learned about the different mechanisms of heat, about insulators, and this here is a question that's very practical. If it's, you know, you get up in the morning and it's 65 degrees, let's say, in your house. When you walk on the carpet, it feels like nice and warm on your feet. And you walk on that floor and it feels really cold. Why? Let, let's try to get the wrong answer that seems obvious out of the way first. Okay, Ashley. No, that's the right answer. <laughs> that, that's the right answer. Yeah, the, the wrong answer that people would answer is that, well, the wood must be colder because it feels colder. Right? That does seem logical, right? But your sensation of hot or cold has to do with the sustained transfer of heat. And so it comes to what Ashley said. The wood is a better conductor of heat than the air is. And so you step on the wood, and it's constantly conducting some small amount. And remember, wood is a reasonably good insulator. But it's conducting some small amount of heat away from you. Hence, your body has to replenish that heat, and it feels cold to you because your body's having to replenish the heat. Whereas the carpet has a bunch of air trapped, which is a super good insulator. And so you have virtually no heat leaving your foot, and it feels warm. That's a good practical thing because how many people have noticed this in their lives? Most of us have. Now we have a sense of why. Now, a slightly different question. On a nice sunny day, you know, you're down at the beach walking barefoot on the dock, obviously at Huntington Beach because you know, you've got to walk out the pier there. And the wood feels nice and comfortable on your feet. But if you step on a nail head, now notice this isn't a pointy nail. You're not stepping on a nail and getting a burn or anything like that. But you step on a pointy nail and, wow, that burns. Why? Ashley? Okay. The point she's making is a reasonably good point, although there's not much difference here. But if you have something like, you have, let's say, um, a checkerboard tile pattern out in the sun. One's black and one's white. They both can have the same conduction at the bottom to lose heat, but the black is going to absorb more than the white, so the black will actually be physically hot. In this case, the nail and the wood are once again the same temperature. They reach equilibrium with their surroundings, thermal equilibrium, no transfer heat to the same temperature. So why does the, the nail feel so hot compared to the wood? 
You have, have people experienced this? I mean, it really feels like you are getting burned. You're like, what the heck? The, the nail, he just walked in. He missed the explanation for the first one. The nail is a better conductor. And so once again, you're going to have a much quicker transfer of heat from the nail into your foot than you have from the wood into your foot. The wood is going to have an initial transfer when you step on it, and then the surface of the wood will very quickly equilibrate with your foot. They'll be the same temperature. There'll be no heat flow, and it'll be fine. So it's warm for a split second, and then it's fine. And then it takes a while for the heat to come up, so it doesn't get much warmer. Now, it is warmer than standing on the carpet, but the nail conducts heat very effectively. You put your foot on there, the top of the nail transfers heat into you, and the rest of the nail says, hey, here's some more heat. Let's get that going. And it just keeps putting heat into your foot. feels hot. Okay, now the new material. In our derivation for the <clears throat> kinetic theory of, of gases, you remember the long derivation starting with the particle bouncing around the box. The end result of that was the kinetic energy. And now I've been really specific and called it the translational kinetic energy. The kinetic energy that's associated with things moving rather than rotating, translating, moving, rather than rotating, staying in one location and moving about that, was three halves N, the number of molecules, times K, the Boltzmann constant, times temperature. What units do we have to use for temperature there? Kelvins, because it's not a change. We can only use Celsius if it's a change. Or if you want to use the gas constant R, three halves NRT, where lowercase n for the number of moles. So we've learned that that derivation was specifically for translational kinetic energy. It's not the only kind of kinetic energy possible. And so the next line I say, what if you have a monatomic ideal gas? Monatomic means your molecules are single atoms. What's an example of a monatomic ideal gas? Helium, right? Helium is a noble gas. It just likes to run around by itself. So its molecule is just one helium atom. So for a monatomic ideal gas, that's the only kind of kinetic energy you can have. And so if you put heat in, the heat is simply going to increase the kinetic energy. So the heat in Q is equal to the change in kinetic energy. So I just take this equation for kinetic energy and I say, okay, the change in kinetic energy, the N isn't changing. We're not, we're not in chemistry. We're not allowing the number of molecules to change. And so it's only going to be temperature that changes. So the heat is equal to three halves, and I'm just going to go with the last one, three halves NRT, or excuse me, three halves NR delta T. Well, we learned before, and by before, problems you've just finished in homework, for calorimetry, we learned that Q is equal to MC delta T. M was the mass, C was the specific heat. If you want to be real technical, it's called the specific heat capacity. Um, but no one says that. We always say specific heat. And of course, delta T was the change in temperature. That applies for solids, for liquids, not so much for gases. For gases, it's going to depend on the conditions of the gas. And so for gases, we are going to talk about the what happens if you put heat in and you keep the volume constant. So this is the constant volume, specific heat for a gas. And in that case, we define it as, so this was for solids and liquids. For a gas, we can either keep the volume constant or the pressure constant as we put heat in. And this one here is Q for constant volume is going to be the number of moles times a heat capacity the subscript V means for constant volume multiplied by the change in temperature. Why is constant volume important in this? Because a change in volume will involve work, which is another way that you can transport energy. So for us to make sure the only energy being transported is heat, we have to keep the volume constant. And so this is a definition that can be used for what the molar heat capacity is at constant volume. Well, if you take this equation and compare it to this equation, 
you see right away that CV, that constant volume heat capacity must be three halves R for a monatomic ideal gas. So if we have an ideal gas, we don't use MC delta T to calculate the relationship between heat and changing temperature. We use N, the number of moles, CV, if it's constant volume, delta T. Well, that was just for monatomic ideal gases. Helium was an example. What's another one? Neon, another one, argon, krypton, xenon, radon. That's about it for your monatomic ideal gases. And of course, yeah, we don't like radon gas. There's not much of it, thankfully. So what about real gases, ones that aren't, I mean, helium is real, don't get me wrong, so is neon. But ones that are more common, you know, air. What is air composed of? Nitrogen and oxygen, roughly 79% nitrogen, 21% oxygen. Both of those are diatomic molecules. It's either O2 or N2. So what we just did doesn't apply to air. So we want to get to something that's more applicable to what we're breathing. And I have to start with this equipartition theorem. Now, the equipartition theorem, we have no proof for it in this class, just a base understanding of what it is. The equipartition theorem is the theorem that says that nature is going to try to put the amount of energy equally in all ways that it can have energy. So kind of think of it like we have buckets and we pour water in and, and nature's gonna try to make so the level in each bucket is the same rather than having this one fill up and then that one starts. That's what the equipartition theorem says. So for a monatomic ideal gas, it can only have energy and kinetic energy. And so you'd usually say, well, that's one bucket, right? Right, and kinetic energy is not a vector. But in physics, when we talk about the ways we can have energy, the degrees of freedom is another way of calling it, it turns out that momentum is what we really are looking at. So we have momentum in the x direction that gives us part of our kinetic energy, momentum in the y direction, momentum in the z direction. And put those all together, it gives you your total. And so we have actually three degrees of freedom for kinetic energy rather than one that it would seem like. So the total kinetic energy of the monatomic ideal gas was three halves NKT. Well, N, each molecule had those three degrees. So for one molecule, it's three halves KT. Put in equal amounts, that means one half KT went into each of those degrees of freedom. And so that's what we get from the X partition theorem. For every molecule, it puts one half KT into each way it can store energy. And so for a monatomic ideal gas, it has three ways and it's three halves KT for each molecule. So for the entire gas, it's N times that three halves NKT for the total energy. Why is that important? Well, it tells us then if we have different degrees of freedom, more ways they can store energy, we're going to have a different fraction out front. Instead of three halves, we'll have more if we have more degrees of freedom. So enter a diatomic molecule. Diatomic molecule, we look at it like a dumbbell. At really low temperatures, you don't have enough energy. That value, one half KT, is less energy than the minimum energy required for a molecule to rotate. Now, at this point, you should be looking at me like I'm speaking kind of stupid talk. Because, you know, I can take this and I can rotate it as slowly as I like. And it's kinetic energy for the rotation is one half I of omega squared. Doesn't matter how slow it is if it's rotating, it has some amount of kinetic energy. But quantum physics is the stupid talk here. Quantum physics says that it can't rotate at any speed you want. There's only certain angular velocities available to it, only certain rotational rates available. And so if your one half kT is less energy, then one half I times the minimum omega squared, you don't have any energy in it. It's not accessible. It's kind of like I'm trying to take this ball and put it on the highest shelf 
I can't reach the top shelf, so it's inaccessible, so I can only go up so high. So at really low temperatures, even a diatomic ideal gas is going to behave like a monatomic ideal gas. But if you get up to reasonable temperatures, room temperature for air is a reasonable temperature, you have enough energy for them to start rotating. Now, some of you people have taken organic chemistry and you've looked at molecular spectroscopy, looking at the different energy levels, and you see these little things off to the side that are different energies in the spin states. So now comes a really funny thing. I can rotate this in three dimensions, you know, about a vertical axis, about a horizontal axis is point to you, and about a horizontal axis is point that way. But if I look at it from the perspective of the pin, the three axes would be like this, that's one, or like this, that's a second, or like this, the third. But if you're talking a diatomic molecule, you know how small atoms are? Yes, no? <laughs> the, the nucleus is on the order of 10 to the minus 15 meters. And if you account for the electron cloud, which is you know, not actually going to be necessarily rotating, is it rotate? That's on the order of something like 10 to the minus 11 meters. So they're really small. So it has essentially no moment of inertia if it rotates this way about its axis, the long axis, which means it can have no kinetic energy in that orientation. So there's only two orientations that can have kinetic energy. Hence, that's adding two degrees of freedom. And so if we add up the total degrees of freedom, it's five degrees of freedom. Hence, the total energy for a diatomic molecule at room temperature is going to be five halves and RT. Five halves RT for each atom, multiply by N to get all the atoms accounted for. And the molar specific heat by going through the same relationship we had here, instead of three halves, that's five halves. So the molar specific heat will be five halves R. Now here's a graph that shows what happens with temperature. If you have really cold diatomic molecules, CV is three halves R. Because it can't rotate, it's too cold. Get up to room temperature, it can rotate. I make the sign. The hand signs for the next one. It can rotate and goes up to five halves. If you get even higher temperature, there is another mode of energy you can have in a diatomic molecule, and that is vibration. In vibration, it's like you take a spring with two masses on either end. And there's two degrees of freedom here. One, because you have the kinetic energy of them moving in and out. And one, because you have the potential energy stored in that spring that's holding them together. Now, what is really holding them together? It's not a physical spring. I know I spoke with a few students about this. That's why I feel comfortable asking. I felt comfortable. Maybe sounds better. It's the electromagnetic force that holds the atoms together in a chemical um, well, in a molecule. And so it's electromagnetic force that has the potential energy associated with it. There's the potential energy you have in the oscillating spring, but there are two vibrational degrees of freedom. So at high temperature, you get up to seven halves R because you've added two more degrees of freedom. So it's, you know, it's, it's an interesting study to understand how nature deals with these things and how we can actually see the theory compare. So now I'm going to go to some real data just to see if our theory really works. So here's some monatomic gases, helium, neon, argon. Their molar specific heats at constant volume are right there, almost exactly the same as what our theory would have predicted, that partition theorem. There is a little variation here with the neon. But, you know, I think most of us look at that and say, yeah, that, that seems like a pretty sound theory. Then we go to diatomics at room temperature. Now, there's a range there. 
21. Theory says it should be at 20.8. These two are really close. The hydrogen is a little bit off, but still I would say those are pretty close, pretty reasonable. I don't know why I calculated the six halves are because we have nothing with six degrees of freedom here. If we had a triatomic molecule, we would be able to have three rotational degrees of freedom and we would have that. Um, so like water um, can have the six at room temperature. Polyatomics, this is going to seven and you can see it's not matching as well for the polyatomics. It's not matching as well because actually the vibrations get more complicated anyway. So we have some experimental data to back up the calculations we did. So the first of our clicker questions, why is CV, the molar specific heat at constant volume, at room temperature greater for diatomic ideal gases than for monatomic ideal gas? Ooh, Trace didn't have to go very far at all this time. <laughs> His battery's low, so he has to come forward. One, two, three more, two more. Noah and Irving. Do you not have yours, Irving? No. Okay. Okay, so we had one, two, eighteen, and one. Pretty strong agreement. Jeff, tell us about the reasons here and, and your answer. Uh, okay. Okay, well, if we go back at really low temperatures, we don't have enough energy to reach the lowest quantum state for rotation. And so at really low temperatures, all we have is translational kinetic energy. As we go up, the first one that becomes available is rotation, which is why that was the correct answer. And so you get up to a room temperature, you have enough energy to make it start rotating, but still not enough to make it vibrate. And then if you get to really high temperatures, you can also make it vibrate, it just goes up to seven halves. Okay, now to chapter 15. Chapter 15 is the last chapter that will be on our test. Um, the test will be a, two weeks from yesterday, and we will not have anything on the test from after Friday, of course. That Friday before break, that's going to be the cutoff for stuff that will be on the test. So chapter 15, we're talking about heat engines. Heat engine, we, we have some ideas, but it's probably not clear. The purpose of a heat engine is to convert thermal energy into mechanical energy. We've talked about mechanical energy a lot. What was mechanical energy? Examples. Okay, rocks at the edge of the cliff has what kind of mechanical energy? Has gravitational potential energy. That was one kind of mechanical energy. The other kind of mechanical energy? Kinetic energy, energy in motion. Now, you might say, but the thermal energy, since temperature is really telling us about the average kinetic energy of the molecules, isn't that also kinetic energy? Uh, technically, yes. But thermal energy is classified separately because it's not really accessible to us. We can't eat the thermal energy, you know, we can't, we can't turn on a heater and absorb that energy and make it useful to us. 
Mechanical energy is the energy that's useful to us. It's energy that we can use for things like driving our cars. Well, in a car, we first convert chemical energy into thermal energy, and then we convert the thermal energy into mechanical energy that drives our cars. So the heat engine, its purpose is to convert energy from an inaccessible method to an accessible one, the inaccessible one being thermal energy. And one could hope that you just take all of the thermal energy and convert it into mechanical energy. But we already know because of the third law of thermodynamics that that's not possible. Third law of thermodynamics is you can't ever reach absolute zero, which means you can't perfectly convert all of your thermal energy into mechanical energy. And as we will learn, the reality is much worse than that. You're lucky if you can convert one third of the thermal energy into mechanical energy. So the point of the heat engine is to convert thermal energy into mechanical energy. The first historically recorded heat engine is this one here, Hero's engine, where you have a pot with water in it. So if we could see inside, we'd see the water in here. And then you put it on a fire. And so that fire is going to be transferring heat into the water. The water gets temperature elevated, eventually gets to the point of boiling. When it boils, the volume it takes expands by a very large amount. And so the volume expands, the pressure goes up. So you have a high pressure gas and you have these tubes that the high pressure gas can go up into, into this empty globe that has two spouts and the spouts are faced. So one will have the gas come out this way. One will have the gas come out that way because it expanded. It's trying to blow out. Well, you go, that gas enters with basically no momentum because it enters both sides equally. So if you have no change in momentum, you have no net force. But when it exits, you have it exiting on the bottom, it's exiting pointing up. So the change in momentum for the gas from when it was essentially stationary here to here was pointing that direction. Well, according to Newton's second law, we know that the net force is change in momentum over change in time. So if the change in momentum for the gas is that direction, then there had to have been a net force on the gas pointing the direction that it's going out. And Newton's third law says we had to have an equal and opposite force on the thing that gave it that. So that means that there was a force, the equal and opposite force that was pushing the direction my arrow is. Now, if we look at the other spigot, it's going to have the same condition. If we add those forces together, what's the net force? The two add the two red ones together. What's the net force? It's zero. They're equal in magnitude because of the symmetry and opposite direction because of symmetry. So net force is zero. But that thing is going to rotate. Why is it going to rotate? Because the torques are the same direction. Torque is R cross F. So if I take the radii for each, or radius for each one, radii is the plural, I have a radius like this and a radius like this. Those radii are again having the same length, but using the right-hand rule, R cross F tells us that for each one of these, if I look up here, radius is going this direction, I have my hand so I can bend my finger so it points parallel to the force, it has a torque coming out. This one here, R goes like that, rotate my hand so my fingers can point the direction of the force, comes out. So the torque is outward for both of those, making it rotate. And so now we have something that has converted the thermal energy, the fire that was burning down below, into mechanical energy, the rotation of that globe. And that is, in essence, what we're doing when we drive our cars, unless you have an electric car. We are heating up air we burn gasoline to make hot air essentially and that hot air then pushes on a piston that makes our car move so our cars are heat engines so yeah <laughs> same example no need to go there any further now we've talked about the laws of thermodynamics but when we apply them it's good to review them again 
So just going quickly through them, the zeroth law was that if object A is in thermal equilibrium with object B, object B in thermal equilibrium with object C, then object A is in thermal equilibrium with object C. A whole lot of words that boils down to the very simple relationship. If objects A and B have the same temperature and objects B and C have the same temperature, then clearly object A and C have the same temperature. Zeroth law. First law, energy cannot be created or destroyed. That's what we're going to focus on here. So I'm going to go past it and then come back. The third law, what we've learned so far is just the energy or question. Um, did I go, did I say third instead of second? Second law is what I meant to say, because that's what I was describing. Second law, we've learned one description of it. And that is that heat will spontaneously flow from hot to cold. So if I bring two things in thermal contact, now we know there are three mechanisms for that thermal contact, either direct physical contact for conduction or having a fluid that flows between them for convection or having the ability of electromagnetic waves to travel from one to the other for radiation. Any one of those is thermal contact. So if I have two objects in thermal contact, heat will spontaneously flow from the hotter one to the colder one. That's the second law. And then the third law I've already referenced in this lecture, nothing can reach absolute zero. Well, we want to focus on the first law here. Energy can't be created or destroyed. If you're a fan of The Simpsons, you may have seen one where Lisa is working on her science project and she develops a perpetual motion machine. And Homer yells at her, Lisa, we obey the first law of thermodynamics in this house. Because perpetual motion machines defy the first law of thermodynamics. They say that you can keep adding energy. In fact, when I was at PUC, my colleague, the other physics professor there, his wife did not buy into this whole first law thing. So she was our registrar. She would go on trips and in the little souvenir shops, they would have these little toys. They're perpetual motion machines and she'd buy them and bring them home and say, look, Bill, proof that you can make a perpetual motion machine. And in fact, most of these machines, you can start them with a little motion. It gets bigger. If this was real, it would be wonderful because I wouldn't pay the power company anything, right? I get one of these little things and, just make it bigger, get a whole lot of them, and use it to power my house. And so he'd have to tear it apart and say, look, see this little battery in here? That's where the energy is coming from. So can't create or destroy energy is one of our fundamental premises in physics. So this first law, super important. So when we talk about a system, U is the symbol for internal energy. You can call it internal energy. You can call it thermal energy. I don't care what you call it. What I care is that you know you is the total energy that you have in there. Now, remember, we talked about heat. Heat is a transport. Some people say, and you know, I used to have this discussion with my colleague, Don Abbey. He thought that you know Holmes Lake has a certain amount of heat in it because you take the mass of the lake times the specific heat of the lake, times you know the change in temperature between absolute zero and the temperature of the lake and that should tell you an amount of heat now of course that glosses over the fact that it has to change phase to get into ice and so on but that's just not the way the words work it's internal energy that it has it has a certain amount of internal energy u and if we add heat to the lake what's going to happen to the lake in response you will go up because we added energy and we will see that in the lake because the temperature will go up. So U is the internal energy, Q is the heat, and it's really important, the Q used in this is the heat in minus the heat out. Not the heat out minus the heat in. I always write Q is equal to the heat added to the system. So if Q is positive, then heat was added and internal energy goes up. So I can write an equation. I start with the change in internal energy is equal to how much energy I added through heat. And that should be plus how much energy I added through the other avenue, work. But you see here it has a minus sign. Some people don't like that minus sign, so they write it with a plus sign. And you know what that leaves? Confused physics students. So what's important is to understand what the first law is and then the equation makes sense. 
when you have this minus sign, which is what our textbook has, then it's defining W as the work out minus the work in. Notice it's just the opposite is the definition for heat. So the work there is the work done by the system. So the work is an energy out in this set of definitions. For people who put a plus sign, they just reverse it and they say the work is the work done on the system. So you have to pay attention. Bottom line is just an energy balance equation. The change in internal energy is equal to the energy you add minus the energy you take away. So that's the first law of thermodynamics. Now, a question to make sure we're still in the game. What variables does the first law of thermodynamics relate? James and Augusta. Assuming you get an answer. Still waiting on one. There we go. Okay, so we had one, zero, eighteen, three. Again, a pretty reasonable selection had the right answer. Abigail. Explain why C was the right answer. Okay, because the equation is delta U is equal to Q minus W. Okay, that's a very good answer. Now, there is another one of these. One person answered A. What are those variables found in? What equation are those found in? The ideal gas law. They're also found in the Van der Waals gas law. Van der Waals. <clears throat> because these are the variables of state. Those are the variables that define the state your gas is in. If you have the pressure, the volume, number of molecules, and the temperature, you know exactly what the state is. You know what its energy is. You know everything about it. Those are all the variables you need to describe a state. Even though in reality, if I'm talking about a state, like if I'm talking about the gas in this room, right, I just need to know the pressure in this room, the volume in this room, the number of molecules, and the temperature, and I know everything. But if you are going to be realistic about it, there's, as I said, the fourth root of a Google, 10 to the 25th, molecules in this room, roughly speaking. And I would need to know six variables for each one of those molecules to describe all the molecules. We can't do that. No human, no computer can do that. So when we're doing thermodynamics, we're trying to treat all of those variables with macroscopic statistical values. So we're basically doing statistics on all of those molecules to tell us about the behavior. And those are the variables of state there, pressure, volume, temperature, and the number of molecules. Now, if you're in chemistry, you might add another one. You have the... Uh, Okay, see, I don't even, I don't ever use this. There's a value for the, um, well, potential energy in a bond. I can't remember what it's even called because you know what I'm not? Chemist. Okay, I have two more follow-up questions. What is the correct definition of Q in the first law of thermodynamics? This is really important, as is the next one. Otherwise, I wouldn't be wasting your time asking another question that I just answered. Yeah. And keep the clickers handy because the next slide I think is also a clicker question. So, Corso James Brandon. <laughs> James is trying to click. There we go. 
Okay, so this time wasn't quite as clear. So go ahead and turn to the person next to you. Go ahead, Kurt. You can talk to the person next to you. See if you can come to a conclusion on which one is correct. Okay, I'm going to live life on the edge and try to open the polling again. Remember the last few times, it's only allowed one person to answer. It's open. Nope, it closed as soon as one person answered. I don't, I've don't. i got to figure out what they changed in this. Okay, that one person said A. That one person, was it you, Corso? No. Nah. Okay. <laughs> Brandon, what do you answer and why? Well, the second time after discussion. Um, okay. Now that's the important, or that's the answer, and it's really important that we know that's the answer, right? Because the first law, the energy balance, if you don't know what Q is, you're sunk. C is the one I tried to rail against. Nothing contains heat. Nothing. Heat is a transfer. You can't contain the transfer. It's I put two things in thermal contact, energy transfers from one to the other. That transitory change in energy, delta U is, well, delta energy is what heat is. Heat removed from the system could have been an answer, but it's not the convention that we use. Next question is like unto this. What is the correct definition of W in the first law as used by our textbook? Our textbook uses delta U is equal to Q minus W. And so if that equation is correct, then W has to mean only one of these options. Okay, Peter. This time we were pretty monolithic. Everybody but one said work done by the system. That's correct. Because it's got a minus sign, that means it's a work going out. Work done by the system is work going out of the system. And so that's the one, and once again, just like a system can't contain heat, it can't contain work. Work is a transfer process. <laughs> you can add numbers. This slide is just saying, can you add numbers, right? Delta U is equal to Q minus W. You look at this picture you have, well, Q in and Q out, since Q is defined as Q out minus Q in, or Q in minus Q out, 40 minus, you know, minus 25 and so on. We, we don't need to do that. The first law of thermodynamics, I'm going to end with this. I was mentioning to a few students that I've lost a fair amount of weight since the end of last school year. How do you do that? It's because our bodies, like everything else, run on energy and the first law of thermodynamics applies. So if I take in less energy than I use, I'm going to shrink. If I take in more energy than I use, I'm going to grow. That's the first law of thermodynamics. Now, it's not quite that simple because if you lower your intake of energy, how do we measure the energy we take in? Counting calories. If I lower the intake, what's my body going to do in response? Yeah, it's going to go into conservation mode, and I'm going to use less. So I take in less, I use less. <clears throat> it makes it a real struggle. But that is an example of the first law in real life. 
There are people I've read a couple articles in the last month who claim that they've gone for years without eating food. They are simply living off of the sunlight. Is there energy in sunlight? Yes, yes, there is. Can our bodies metabolize that energy? No, 